Good morning, everyone. How's your reInvent going? Thumbs up, thumbs down. It's great to have you here. My name is Mark Ryland. I'm the director of the Office of the CISO at AWS. And I'm here to talk about the EC2 Nitro architecture with a particular lens on the security implications thereof. It's exciting to give this talk after the Monday night uh, live and the keynote where there was a lot of talk about Nitro and what Nitro can accomplish uh, and what we can achieve with this uh, reimagining and reinventing of traditional virtualization. I hope to go a little deeper, so in case it's not super clear yet exactly how this thing works, I hope that this talk will both illustrate that uh, and we'll take about um, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes to talk about these topics. First, uh, traditional virtualization and some of its limitations, what kind of drove us to think about a new way of doing virtualization. Then talk about the Nitro architecture as a whole. And then spend the last, oh, 40% of the talk, or maybe 50%, we'll, we'll focus on the, we'll draw out the security implications, which some of which will be, I think, apparent kind of early on, but we'll focus in on those. Um, very briefly talk about uh, enclaves, which was announced yesterday. Um, don't have a whole lot of material on that for you, um, but we can talk afterwards if necessary. And hopefully have some time for questions as well. So let's jump in. Traditional virtualization has limitations. And to, to talk about that, we'll talk about ourselves. So we have been running uh, Zen-based EC2 architecture for many years, what, 11 years, 12 years now? Um, with great success. Uh, we're super proud of our Zen architecture, Zen fleet. It'll continue to run for some years. Uh, it works great. Uh, we perfected a lot of, of the hard problems you need to perfect in a massively scaled implementation of virtualization with things like uh, hot patching of the fleet and all kinds of new capabilities. But in the end, it's still a pretty traditional model where the bulk of the work is, is, done, is done in software. And let's talk about that. So in a traditional um, Im implementation, we'll take this example of this uh, EC2 instance, the CR1, which was kind of our last great instance fit type before we begin to implement some of the har hardware offload capabilities. This was January 2013. This is a really awesome machine. It had you know, a couple of beefy Xeon processors, lots of memory, lots of um, disk, local disk storage, 10 gig networking that worked really well. And like all virtualization, even to the present day, it also had this privileged copy of an operating system the, in Zen terminology of the DOM0 the privileged OS that is a critical part of the, of the system and the trusted computing base, we'll get into why, and every virtual system uses a copy of an operating system typically to do a lot of important functions which are then mirrored through to the guests which are, which are not privileged. So let's talk about this, uh, just start with the very basics here. We'll, we'll look at the, 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 the bootload process. Actually, this is, I'm, I'm using assembly language of Zen itself, but this you can virtualize, you can hypervise hypervisors, so it's a good example. Most of the time, when you're hypervising an operating system or some piece of code, that code is executing directly on the processor. In fact, this is a great interview question. If I used to interview people that said they knew a lot about virtualization, and I would say, okay, how does it really work? Does the does the hypervisor watch the instruction issue of the, of the guest and kind of like look at each instruction, decide whether to execute it or not? Or does it kind of most of the time the guest execute natively? And once in a while the hypervisor somehow magically evolved? Well, the answer of course is the latter. In fact, unless the guest is executing 80 or 90% of the time natively, you're not, it's not really hypervising. You're basically doing software interpretation of, of, uh, of machine language. But in a, in a normal virtualization environment, most of the instructions execute natively, but there are certain privilege instructions. So this first instruction's fine, it's, it's adding a couple registers. Get to the next instruction, and it's a set interrupt. Okay, a set interrupt instruction is a privilege instruction. Why? Because the interrupt tables are essentially hardware mappings, and you really can't let a guest operating system manage its own interrupts. So you have to take that instruction and emulate it somehow. And that's exactly what happens. So the hypervisor wakes up, and it wakes up because the hardware has a, an understanding of what are privileged instructions and what are not privileged instructions. And it knows how to trap, meaning pause, and wake up hypervisor code when those privilege instructions happen. So you get a special kind of error from that code. Hypervisor wakes up, the virtual machine monitor, um, the kind of core of the hypervisor, and in this case, does something relatively simple. Now, again, there's nothing really simple in these worlds, but relatively simple, which is, okay, I'm gonna take this interrupt instruction, and I'm going to 
map it into my real interrupt handler table, and I'm gonna map it in a way such that if I get an interrupt from that device and the device is mapped to that guest, I know to then send a fake interrupt to the guest, but if it doesn't belong to that guest, I'm obviously not gonna ever send that interrupt to it. So basically it creates that layer of indirection, and it does that kind of deep in, in the system. And uh, in this case, the, the, the VM virtual machine monitor is, is doing this with, without a lot of help. It's just basically kind of a core part of what hypervisors do. They do things like CPU allocation, memory allocation, creating these layers between hardware and software and so forth. This is one of those core functions. Next, next instruction, so you emulate that, so the guest system thinks that it set an interrupt, can't tell the difference between actually setting an interrupt and someone emulating that setting of an interrupt. Go to the next instructions, everything's fine. Now we're gonna go to this in instruction and that is, uh, kind of opens a whole another can of worms because now the guest wants to do IO. It wants to, to interact with the outside world through some device. It wants to essentially map some of its memory into the um, memory of a device and be able to communicate with the device and things get a lot hairier here because devices are complicated, there's a million of them, there's a million drivers. The world of device management is a really, really different kind of problem for a hypervisor than things like setting interrupts or mapping memory. Memory is a great example where, again, before m more modern uh, hardware had two levels of memory indirection. So, you know, you have these virtual memory systems, right? So you have logical memory and physical memory. And prior to about 2006 or seven, um, AMD had this first and then Intel came out with that. The hardware vendors came out with two levels of indirection to memory. There's two TLBs. So there's a mapping of logical to physical memory at one layer and then there's another layer below that that's the actual mapping of logical to physical memory. And prior to that, if you were hypervising, every time you did a context switch from one guest to another, you had to take all of the mappings out of that table and then substitute in the other mappings that belong to that guest. So basically context switching was really expensive until you have two levels, in which case the operating system gets its own indirection because it understands virtual memory, it knows how to do logical to physical mapping, and the hypervisor has the real one below that. And now when I do a context switch, it's much more efficient. Um, by the way, it's also a way that operating systems can tell when they're being hypervised because on a modern processor, they know when they're on a modern processor and they see there's only one TLB, they're like, oh, I'm running on a hypervisor. Not only that, but you know, engineers being what they are, nobody, <laughs> is that naive anymore. So the operating systems absolutely know when they're being hypervised. In fact, they even change their instruction paths when they're being hypervised. And not dramatically, but they do change some very core primitives and do them differently because they can get a little performance win, five, three, five percent if they behave differently when being hypervised than when running on native hardware. So there's even special instructions you can set, you can send down, like Microsoft calls this the enlightened interface. I don't know, forget what the Linux name for this, but the operating system sends a couple of puts a couple things in register, sends an instruction, and basically says, hey, is there a hypervisor down there? And the hypervisor says, yep, I'm down here. And then it behaves differently after that. So this is no longer a naive system, but basically this is the way that the modern systems work is through this indirection. But let's talk about that device model now. This is where things are gonna get a little hairy. Devices are complicated. There's a million of them. There's a million drivers. This is just a really painful part of the world of emulating hardware. And early on, the hypervisor vendors in the x86 space made a, a very strategic decision, which is we're not going to deal with this. We're going to run another operating system, which is part of the privileged computing base, and that we're going to delegate these I.O. things to that operating system, which will then do all the ugly device stuff. What we as a hypervisor will do will be present a very simple model back to the guests, which kind of maps through that DOM0, and the DOM0 will handle the actual yucky, ugly stuff create kind of an idealized version of that, like a block, block, block forward block driver for Zen, what have you. And the guests will see these really simple devices and will basically just emulate all this stuff by means of the DOM0, which does a lot of this really nasty work for us. Oh no, by the way, since we have this operating system running there, we'll take advantage of the fact we'll run other stuff there. We have an interactive shell, we can log in and troubleshoot, we, you know, basically privilege access, we can, if you're running a, a cloud service like we do, you run a bunch of other software there. You run CloudWatch metrics gathering, you run your billing information, you run you know, all the stuff that's doing the essentially local things that the API, the command, the control plane needs to do to start and stop and pause and hibernate. All those kinds of things are 
talking to software running in that DOM0. So it gets to be a pretty big and complicated piece of software. So we looked at this architecture at the early days of the Nitro journey and said, we don't really like this model. How can we do better? First of all, part of the promise of a system like EC2 is to try to provide the absolute most consistent experience we can for customers. We want you to have the same experience whether there's someone really busy on, else busy on that host or not, whether someone is doing a lot of network traffic or not, all those kinds of variables, the so-called noisy neighbor problem. I, I challenge you to test those things. You can test those things, by the way, because we have this feature called dedicated hosts where you actually know that you're launching your instances onto the same physical hardware. And if you do that and you test out, I think you'll find that you'd be really happy with how well isolated each guest is one from another. Put a ton of engineering work into making it so that you're not going to get throttled, or you're not going to be disturbed if someone else is really busy or they're not. You get a very consistent experience. But that also means that our software has to be isolated from you. Because we're running a bunch of software on that same motherboard, that same main board, or Intel processor, or AMD. Actually, I don't think we have any Zen. Let's say Intel processors. I think all our AMD and Graviton processors are Nitro. I know a lot of Graviton ones are. Um, so, our software is running there in that DOM0, and we have to reserve capacity for that. We have to reserve cores, and we have to reserve memory, because if we don't do that, once we, if we get busy, you're going to have a bad day, and we don't want that. So the net effect of that is that about 10% of the total cores in our Zen fleet are reserved for us. That's a lot. When you're talking about millions of hosts and billions of dollars of investment in hardware, and by the way, the, is great, as we have a great relationship with Intel, we get great pricing, special chips, blah, blah, blah. But a very significant percentage of the cost of host is the Intel product expensive. They're very valuable, very expensive pieces of, of technology. So to take 10% of all that and not be able to sell it to customers, that's not good from our perspective. There's other good reasons that are not quite so selfish. That's one of them, though. It's just wasteful, basically. We're doing generic housekeeping tasks. Um, you know, we're doing very repetitive things that you know, don't require like a tremendously flexible capability, set of capabilities. We're doing certain types of acceleration that are just highly repetitive. Think of all the encryption we, we, we want to do. We want to encrypt everything. Well, even with the you know, special Intel instructions that you know, accelerate AES encryption, it's still expensive. It still takes quite a bit of CPU power to do like line read encryption of networking or block storage, whatever. So basically, looking at this picture, we just didn't like it. The DOM0 is this big, complicated piece of software. It's got a ton of features, got a lot of, you know, big attack surface, if you will, if you put on your security hat. It's actually a really convenient landing zone should, in the event of the hypothetical hypervisor breakout never happened in the wild, but everyone should still, we still worry about it. We're super careful about it. If it should ever happen, now you've got a place to land. You've got a shell, you've got tools, you can run normal Linux, you know, commands. I mean, that's bad. You don't want it to be easy. Uh, if something goes wrong, you don't want there to be a landing place. So all these things led to this vision of, can we apply like this microservice model of like breaking this down into components, building small components, interchangeable, reusable, and reconstructing virtualization with hardware acceleration, hardware offload, and making the hypervisor very minimalistic and doing all the work that's normally done in that DOM0. Let's do it somewhere else. That's the Nitro vision. And that's what we've built with Nitro. So I'll skip, uh, I'll go rapid, very rapidly through this. There's a really good online talk from two years ago, Anthony Liguri's talk about the history of Nitro. He takes you step by step and actually names the instance types where we began this process. We didn't do it all at once. We started with network offload. We took the VPC software, which was running in DOM0. VPC software does all the virtual networking. It takes every single packet from every single guest, wraps it inside a different thing, and sends it on a physical network. On the other side, the packet gets unwrapped and back to the, you know, to the virtual layer. A, there's a lot of work that goes on there. There's security groups, knackles, all that kind of stuff. It all was running in DOM0. So the, that's the first device model we took and we ran on specialized hardware. We actually took these um, devices were, it was kind of primitive, kind of cool experiment. We used an off-the-shelf um, offload card that was you know, highly programmable and powerful. Um, and we took a regular network card, um, an Intel data center class NIC, we put both those in the same box and we ran like a little four inch loopback cable from one NIC to the other NIC. Uh, the second one had two RJ45 jacks. And the first one, 
would, the hypervisor would slice that device up in its normal way and it would assign VLAN tags to all the guests. On the other side of that little four inch cable, this other piece of hardware and software would look at those VLAN tags and say, oh, that's, you know, DOM3. That's part of VPC's ABCD AFG. Okay, now I'm gonna wrap that packet accordingly and send it off on the real network. So basically you have these kind of two network cards, but all the work, besides the very minimal VLAN tagging, was being done on the second one. And this worked really well. <laughs> we got way reduced jitter, lower latency, great performance. It was a super successful experiment. So that was like, okay, we're onto something here. So the next device model we took was block storage, in this case, EBS storage. Right around that same time, the NVMe protocol was coming into the market, so invented by, a, I think, an IEEE committee um, of, you know, how, let's, how do we modernize access over a high-speed bus to essentially SSD drives, which are just so much faster that they really needed a much more dynamic and uh, high-performance inter uh, hardware interface. So NVMe was just coming online, um, and we really liked it, and we wanted to use that as kind of a, a core design uh, center going forward. So we took, um, we took another piece of hardware from a vendor that I'll mention in a second, who had already begun to build NVMe emulation in their little harbor device. So they could emulate an NVMe device and then run out sort of arbitrary code to do whatever you want on the other side. So we built software that said, that looked like NVMe on the PCIe bus, but it was actually an EBS implementation. So the EBS client moved out of DOM0 and into this offload card. Now that offload card from that uh, maker was a little company called Annapurna Labs. Now you've heard, Annapurna Labs, we love this company, we love their technology, we bought them. They've become our sort of fabulous design firm for a lot of this innovation that you've heard talked about this week. The Inferentiate chip, Inferentia chip, the Graviton, all designed by Annapurna Labs. So, but the funny thing was, in this generation, NVMe was so new that there wasn't good operating system support yet in the device drivers. So like to get NVMe working with Windows at the time, or even Linux was kind of wonky. You had to like do special things to get it to work. So we made a kind of funny decision, which was, DOM0 used an NVMe emulator talking to this offload card, but it mapped traditionally back through block forward, block back devices to the Zen clients so they could use their old device drivers. But again, with experience was really positive. We love the company we were working with, bought the company, said, okay, this is, we're, gonna, we're just gonna keep moving forward. So then we moved device, um, you know, block, the next thing to move was instant storage. And then the remain, those are the three biggies, right, for EC2. Networking, EBS, the inst instant storage. But there's a lot of other junk. You gotta emulate, it, I mean, operating systems won't boot if they don't see VGA cards and keyboards and stuff like that. I mean, it's crazy, but you know, you gotta emulate all that stuff. It's something, something like you might have seen, like QEMU will do for you in a kind of normal environment. We had to build that as well in an emulated hardware accelerated way. So we took all that, and we had to move all our software, CloudWatch metrics, um, you know, the DNS daemon that's running there, there's a bunch of other stuff running there um, that uh, the instance metadata service. I'm giving a talk on that tomorrow. You'd love, love to see you there. Um, that, ran, that ran in DOM0, right? You're, you, when you talk to that special 169.254.169.254, that's just a magic address that the hypervisor traps and sends to itself and says, you know, answers your questions about what's, you know, what's relevant to that instance in terms of introspection about the instance. So all that software had to be rewritten and moved. And that's what we did, and the first kind of pure nitro uh, system was the C5. I'm gonna use the M5D for various reasons as kind of my early nitro design that to this present day still continues this basic model. So in a nitro system now, you have a very, very thin minimalistic hypervisor based on the KVM uh, uh, code base, but really stripped down. We'll talk more about what's been taken out in a minute. And then you have hardware emulation of all the devices. So even that hypervisor doesn't see anything but like a fake VGA card, a fake keyboard, all that stuff is faked out by other hardware running on these nitro controllers, nitro computers. There's at least two or three of these, depends on the, you know, it's an implementation detail, maybe there could be one, but in, in, in reality there's two or three of these other processors, or other really computers, separate computers. Uh, sometimes there's many, as many as eight or 10, it just depends on the, on the need, but essentially you can think of it as there's a nitro cluster running inside the same physical host. It has its own private network to create its own little virtual reality around the main board. 
Now, mainboard and these devices all have the share of the same PCIe bus, but this cluster of hardware and software called Nitro creates for the mainboard this simulated world, a world in which all networking is VPC networking, and a world in which the, your local in, NVMe d boot device that the BIOS says is, is you know, the device zero to boot from, that's a EBS volume. There's no, there's no device potentially in that host at all. That's all done in this Nitro system running in and around a, a main board. And the main board now has a very minimalistic hypervisor that has this kind of very core functions that we talked about at the beginning. It, it slices up memory. It allocates CPUs and memory hard. It pins VMs to memory. We never move VMs from CPU to CPU. We always hard allocate for, for you, again, to give you that common experience to avoid a bunch of issues around side channels, et cetera. You get your own core, at least one, and your own memory. We don't overcommit. Now, the T family is a different thing. I'll bracket that. Let me just, you know, we'll talk about it afterwards. But we have to treat the T family a little differently. It's our overcommitted instance family. It's an awesome technology. You should definitely use it. It has this really cool way of dealing with overcommitted capability through CPU credits, which are, make it a potentially unpredictable role, very predictable. And it also has things like live migration and all cool technologies so we can rebalance hot systems, et cetera. T family is different. In T family, we also have a bunch of magic and IP around protecting you from uh, the fact that you may, may actually be running on the same core that another guest was running on a short time ago. But Believe me, we take a tremendous amount of care in that. But in our normal case, all other instance families, we never do that. You're always pinned to a core. You're always pinned to memory. We never coalesce memory. We never do the tricks that hypervisors do of sharing pages across guests, blah, blah, blah. None of that stuff. Just very, very simple, very clean. And that hypervisor still does those things. So <clears throat> now, of course, I'm showing an example of kind of a droplet filler, a host filling instance, right? The, the big 24XL of this family. But of course, you can slice these things up, and you can create, um, oh, by the way, uh, we'll get more to this in a second, but it's kind of the world, world's worst build, build slide there. But you see those little encryption keys coming up? So all the encryption for all this stuff, by the way, is done on these Nitro cards. So EBS encryption, instant storage encryption, VPC encryption increasingly um, is all done accelerated in hardware. and very nicely, the encryption keys are totally inaccessible from that main system board. So even if something goes badly wrong there, there's no encryption keys on that host as far as all the software running there, including our software. Speaking of our software, you can slice it up into lots of little VMs. Or what's the next logical step? It's like, why do I need a hypervisor at all? You don't. Every single thing that a virtual system needs to do is being done off the main board. So I can sell you the main board. You can be a tenant of that. Now, there's some other things we need to do in that case, because now we have what's called serial multi-tenancy, right? Somebody else was using it 10 minutes ago. And if we were naive and did something when we were dumb, we would potentially cause problems, because they might have left a little gift behind for you, right? But we, don't, we take care of that, and I'll talk in great detail about that. <clears throat> So we can sell you bare metal. And these are full EC2 instances. That is the key point. There are other cloud-like cloud technologies that have said, well, we'll give you bare metal. But they're never the same. They're like, usually, you know, first of all, they don't boot in three minutes. They usually is like a two-hour process. And secondly, they're like pixie booting or something. And, and they don't have all the same features that the hypervised things have. This is a EC2 instance. It has CloudWatch metrics, has the instance metadata service, it's always on a, in a VPC, it always has EBS, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, your boot volume in bare metal case is EBS. And in fact, because we're using these modern dr driver technologies and hardware cooperation of the PCIe bus where we can map through very efficiently, even in the hypervised case, the same device driver can talk to one of these devices using something like SRIOV, single root IO virtualization, which means that the, very, so the, the hypervisor will set up a kind of secure channel between you and that bus, but once that's configured, you get really fast high-speed access to the device over the bus in a, in a safe and sane way. Therefore, the very same AMI can boot bare metal or hypervised. Same exact device drivers. Just in one case, they're mapped for you magically. In the other case, they just talk to hardware. Well, not really to hardware, but special hardware that's really software running on these processors. So that enables things like the VMware partnership, where you don't have to do two layers of virtualization. You just get native VMware running on bare metal. You are being virtualized for everything else. Your VMware 
instance is running inside of EPC. It's not running on the EC2 substrate. Uh, it's using EBS volumes and so forth. So that's all being the same, but at least from a kind of core virtualization perspective, VMware is running on bare metal. Similarly, we have this really cool technology I don't have time to go into called Firecracker, which, in which we've essentially tried to bridge the worlds of containers and virtualization by making what are called, um, you know, it's very lightweight virtualization uh, in which you can boot an entire full KVM VM in less than 125 milliseconds. And so you can run thousands of containers on one of these hosts and you get full isolation between customers in a way that would never, no one, well, we would never trust uh, container isolation to be an adequate boundary between customers. There's just too many things that could go wrong in a Linux, you know, C group or comp, sec comp or whatever. So don't, no one, I hope no one does that, but uh, we would never do it. So for really fast, lightweight VMs, we invented this technology called Firecracker. I encourage you to look into it. It just happens that it all, it works great. It runs on bare metal, so it still has all the f features and capabilities of EC2, which is awesome. So just to drive home these points before we move to the security section, I'm gonna walk through an EBS volume attach API call. Like what really happens with a Nitro system? Let's say it's running, we'll block or we'll bracket whether it's bare metal or hypervised for the moment. You create a volume and you say, I wanna attach the volume to my instance, okay? So you call the API for attach volume. At the API endpoint, there's a bunch of microservices that run around, provisioning, creating entries and databases, et cetera. Um, and then in, in a little uh, few milliseconds later, an actual command is sent to the Nitro controller from the EBS control plane saying, hey, um, you know, user so-and-so who happens to have a VM on your host has just asked for a volume, so create one for them. We've done all the back-end provisioning we need, you know, thin provisioning, blah, 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 so we create this environment where the volume will start working. The controller then sends the command to the next Nitro computer, it's, could be the same computer, a different one depends on the implementation, but basically another subsystem that controls EBS. So all the commands come to one kind of central controller and then it distributes those out across the other Nitro computers. And so the EBS controller gets the command, hey, create volume. So the next step is where things are different. So EBS then sends a PCI hot plug event on the PCIe bus. So now, who's ever on that bus says, hey, Someone just materialized a new storage, uh, NVMe storage volume for me. Now, <clears throat> there it is. And if you're hypervised, that's a privileged message and the, only the hypervisor will see it. They'll allocate a device and then mirror it through to the guest. And the guest will then get its own hot plug event, et cetera. If you're not hypervised, then it's just an event, and your operating system or your hypervisor will pick it up and mount that, vault, that new NVMe device, and so this EBS volume will look like a local SSD drive. So, again, just summarizing some of the key aspects, we took all these software concepts, um, and we've moved them into sort of software-defined hardware implementations. There's still general purpose processors running, on, and we're still, so these, you wouldn't be shocked to know that these Nitro controllers, they have some very specialized ASICs and, and chips, but they also have an ARM processor on them running, you know, more or less conventional stripped down version of Linux and running our software. So we've, you know, can get a lot of code reuse. We actually use Rust for a lot of the implementation because we really love Rust and you're gonna hear more and more about that as the years go by, I think, a very safe and sane way to write super high performance low level code. If you follow the, the programming conventions, which are nicely restrictive and painful, but if you follow them, you get really, really type safe, memory safe code, which is what we all want. Um, so we use that a lot in these Nitro systems. Um, so we basically kind of reinvented virtualization as this, you can think of it now as a microservices architecture. Each one of these kind of logical, quasi-physical devices, they look like physical devices to the rest of the world. Our software implementation is running on these special computers and we can mix and match these things, plug and play them, and innovate very rapidly by all the advantages of microservices, because as long as you maintain that API, that maybe NVMe API with the outside world, you can do whatever you want behind the covers. You can rewrite your thing from C to Rust, you can change the, completely change the processor, you can do anything you want as long as you maintain that contract. And so by decomposing the system into these um, components, we've done, I, we believe, a really, uh, 
a, a really big improvement in how people do virtualization. So now let's get into the security benefits. We've got, it's, timing is about right. I've got about half my session left. So we'll go through these in the kind of standard security fashion, talk about confidentiality, integrity, availability, but I'm gonna flip these and do confidentiality last because it's more fun. So let's do uh, integrity and availability first. So integrity, so the Nitro system focuses a lot on integrity. Um, and again, the key thing here is that the Nitro controller is the root of trust, not the main board. We don't have to trust that main board. We can't trust the main board actually because it could be attacking us if it's in a bare metal scenario. So the Nitro controller controls the whole boot process. It has its own very secure boot method with cryptographic binding between itself and a tiny little boot drive that's in the back of the device. You can, it's funny, I've got one of these devices in my office if you ever come visit me, they're pretty cool. Um, and there's a little SATA cable, a little lowly SATA drive in the back of the device. It snakes up through the front where the Nitro controller sits and it's like, yep, that's its boot drive. No, nothing else in the world is connected to it, but that's how it uh, can do secure boot. And it also has to manage secure software update with code signing, et cetera, et cetera. But that Nitro controller is really, it, that is the EC2 instance, really, I mean, the EC2 system. The main board is the customer workload coprocessor. Think of it, you know, it's like a special coprocessor that runs VMs but it's not the, the trust, trusted base of the system. So the Nitro controller boots, our automated reasoning group, the people in our company that do this really cool work around formal verification of code, they actually have a really cool academic paper on Nitro boot process, I'd encourage you to go read it. They've done um, you know, formal verification that the boot code does what it says it does, it doesn't have any memory flaws, it doesn't have any um, code paths that could result in corruption of any kind. So we've kind of, you know, we're gonna keep extending what we do with that capability of, of trusted, uh, of you know, formal verification of code. It's a big, big thing we do now more and more across lots of what we consider to be some of our most security sensitive systems. Um, this one was done about a year ago. This Nitro system checks the integrity of all these computers um, and then it continues on with a, a boot of the, main, of the main system board. So let's walk through that. <clears throat> this is where uh, things get really interesting because we take this you know, somewhat conventional system board and we add one really important, very simple um, logic chip. We call this the Nitro security chip. It's not that fancy. It's not like a fancy TPM or something because again, the trust is in the Nitro controller, but it is, does two really, really critical things. First of all, it prevents the main, the main processor from updating firmware in that system. So the main processor has read access to firmware, but it doesn't have write access to firmware. And the logic chip that makes that true is this thing called the Nitro uh, security chip. However, we assume there might be bugs in that. Right? Maybe it's not working correctly. So we also do the following. Every time the system boots, and it would always reboot after a, uh, after a customer use it in bare metal mode, every time the system reboots, this chip does some other, one other thing, which is it's involved in the post process and it holds the whole system board in reset. Very early in the boot process, the board freezes, control is passed to the Nitro controller. Nitro controller then does an entire scan of all the firmware on the device, compares it to the hashes that it's stored of known good uh, firmware, and only if the hashes match does it then allow the boot to continue. So now you've got a, a double check there. You've got belt and suspenders, right? You shouldn't be able to update that firmware, but if you ever were able to somehow, we would detect that and we would take that system out of service and get some pretty interesting forensics projects going and find where the, where the bug was, frankly. So we do that and if everything checks out, then we continue through the normal boot. What's not normal about it is the hypervisor doesn't actually boot from like a device, it's injected and kind of more like a, um, like a firmware way, method. Uh, the Nitro controller has a, copy of the hypervisor that it knows is the, the known good state and puts that into the memory of the system, actually reserves some more memory we'll talk about in a second for a second copy of the hypervisor, and then it continues on with, uh, with the boot process. But again, the boot process now, so the hypervisor is a control, but the boot process that goes forward is gonna be the boot of the guests because once that hypervisor is there ready to roll, you know, there's really nothing else to do in terms of loading. So it, it again, uh, we inject the hypervisor and then you either boot the bare metal guest from a fake NVMe device that's actually an EBS volume or uh, you boot it 
from a fake NVMe device uh, back through to the guest in a, in a hypervised fashion. So really, you can think about this as defense in depth. Like most of the time, and it's reasonable, we trust hypervisors. One of their core security features or requirements is that they must prevent guests from updating firmware, right? That would be really bad if guests could change firmware. So hypervisors do that, and they're fine, and they, they work well, uh, as far as anyone knows. And we do that too in the hypervised case, but we have to deal with this unhypervised case. So now we've got this defense in depth, and therefore, even when you're hypervised, you're still going to get those extra layers of protection such that the guest cannot um, do something bad to the physical system and the firmware, or even if by some terrible means they're able to get control of that full system, um, they can't do anything bad in terms of uh, you know, corrupting it and making it so the next user is in trouble. Now, availability. So I'm going to kind of turn this in a, a, a maybe a slightly different direction than you might have expected, but here I want to focus on the fact that this system, and one of the reasons it took quite a while to build and, and, and deploy, is that we had to, we wanted to make every single thing hot updatable. We wanted to make it so we could update all of these components, VPC networking, EBS, all that stuff, be able to update it to a new build with either new features or bug fixes, whatever is required, in a way that doesn't require downtime for the guests. So that means that we can still, for example, keep pumping packets for you while we're changing the VPC software, and then at one critical moment, you might see a little sub-millisecond hiccup, and then everything keeps working. Meanwhile, we've actually, under the covers now, completely changed the software that is doing VPC encapsulation for you. And we've taken that all the way to the hypervisor itself. We can hot update hypervisors without guest downtime. Again, you might possibly be able to detect a tiny hesitation, you know, me measured in, in microseconds when we switch hypervisors underneath you, but, um, you know, it's just, it's very seamless. So that's a really nice property of a large-scale virtualization platform that we don't have to reboot the guests when we need to do some maintenance or patching or updating or feature additions to the underlying system. So that is a really, really nice property of the Nitro system as well. All of this stuff is controlled through a full DevOps pipeline. Different teams own different components. We have this nice properties of uh, separation of duties. If I'm on the, you know, if I'm pushing VPC software, I have no right or power to update software that has to do with EBS and vice versa. Each team has its own uh, security controls and parameters around who can update the code, who can push the code, et cetera, and lots of security thought goes into that whole process with code signing and verification to make sure that everybody's getting uh, proper system images as systems change and modify, which they do. And again, you have to be able to update and modify and add features to systems as you go along. And that's, that's a key thing in a, in a, in a cloud, micro, uh, cloud service architecture. So let's talk a little bit now to confidentiality, and we'll kind of spend the rest of our time there. Um, encryption. So I put up those little lame keys in an earlier slide, my, my like world, I call it the world's worst build slide. And, uh, but this is really important, actually, because we want to encrypt everything. There's just like, if you, can, if you can throw a little bit of hardware at it and a little bit of software, like, why not? There's no downside, except performance would be a downside. But with hardware acceleration, we can eliminate that issue because we're not taking CPU power away from you, the, the customer, and we can even upgrade you and do things like, you know, we're essentially upgrading your network so it's encrypted but you don't notice any slowdown because we have enough power in those coprocessors to do that. Um, we'll talk about when, when we do that, but certainly in the case, all your EBS traffic, all your instance storage can be, and is uh, in the instance case, storage case, it's always encrypted. EBS now has an account-wide flag, which is kind of cool. You can set an account flag that says, just encrypt all my EBS volumes. Just don't even ask me anymore. In fact, we override your parameters. I, I tested it. Couldn't resist testing this when that feature came out. I was like, well, what if I specify an unencrypted volume? Well, allow me to override. Now it doesn't, I mean, it, there's no error message, but <laughs> it, it doesn't work. It's still encrypted. Um, and again, we can do that because we have the accelerator in the hardware so that the customer doesn't suffer performance impact of us adding all these features under, under the covers. Instant storage is a really interesting case because there, if you look inside one of these boxes, you see uh, I have one that has eight terab terabytes of um, SSD drive, so it's an i3, i3P and in the back of the host, and they have little um, cable, PCIe extension cables that run 
but they don't run to the PCIe bus of the, ho of the main board, they run to a nitro controller. And then the nitro controller has a little cable that runs to the main board. So the main board cannot talk directly to those drives, it always goes to the nitro controller. And the nitro controller does line rate encryption. Every time a volume is created, it materializes a new AES-256 key out of its special hardware that does very nice random keys. And then it uses that key for the lifetime of the volume, and if whenever the volume is deleted, the key is thrown away, and when the new volume is created, we create a new key. So we're crypto deleting every single time there's any change of volume ownership in, in those instant storage volumes. We also send the commands to the NVMe, NVMe device, hey, delete yourself, you know, zero yourself. I mean, we do that too, but like, why not, again, do, do everything twice, it's, it's safe. There's actually a quirky um, thing. When this first feature first came out, I had a solutions architect on my team, a really sharp guy, um, and he was dinking around with this, and he's like, wait a second. When I reboot one of these, or when I re change one of these instant storage volumes, the first 16 kilobytes are zeroed, and the last 16 kilobytes are zeroed. Like, why is it, it should either be all random or it should be all zero. Like, you, you can imagine either one of those engineering choices where you show through your new volume is zeroed or as garbage because you're just showing through the old encryption, old encrypted text, cipher text. And so, um, so we talked to the engineering team, like, well, it turns out that op a lot of operating systems get really confused if they see, like, garbage on disks. So, in order to not confuse them, <laughs> we zero the beginning and end before we hand it to the operating system. So it's kind of funny um, as, as an initialization thing, but one of these little quirks. Um, now, VPC is gonna take some time because there, it's gonna take a while to upgrade the whole fleet to this latest generation of hardware that can do full line rate encryption at 100 gigabits per second. So you heard uh, Peter DeSantis' talk, I hope, the Monday Night Live, where he talked about all the work we're doing to get HPC workloads to run on a very generic, very powerful, but very generic cloud network. And part of that is these in instance types which do 100 gigabit per second networking. All of those instance types also do line rate encryption at 100 gigabits per second. However, they only do it when they're talking to other in, in instance types. So it's not backwards compatible because if I send encrypted traffic to an old instance type, it wouldn't know what to do with it. So it'll take time, give us a couple years. Um, as the in families become dominant and pre predominant, then it, there'll come a point where even inside the data center, all of your data will be encrypted on the wire all the time. That's our goal. But that one we couldn't do by just flipping a switch because it just, that you would have noticed a performance impact. So, and frankly, the risk of unencrypted traffic, well, first of all, you should all encrypt your traffic, so please use TLS, you know, do it. Assume that for some reason you can or you forget. Data inside our data center is not at risk. We have really, really good physical controls around the data techs in there, metal detectors. They can't bring anything in there that they could exfil data with. If you jack into a switch, alarm, Fire, you know, they have their own separate uh, Wi-Fi network for the work inside the data center that's totally disconnected from the customer network. So we feel really good about the, the network security inside our facilities. So this feature is more like just a cool thing to do as opposed to like addressing an actual risk. But it's a cool thing to do and we want to do it. And we'll, but we'll get there, but it requires the hardware acceleration. Now the other case, outside our physical control, Peter also talked about that, Project Lever, which we announced kind of quietly about eight months ago. That one actually really matters because undersea cables are not very secure. <laughs> um, there are nation states with special submarines, okay? And even the way the physical security of kind of generic like uh, runs of undersea cables, there's, you can go Google, you know, like the security of a um, beachfront, you know, building where cables emerge, they're not, they're not, it's not done very well. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing for the industry, but the physical security of kind of wide area networks is not great. Um, so we've worked really hard and long to do it, make it the case that whenever you get on our backbone and you're inside one of our facilities and you leave that facility and you go into physical space that we don't have control of, could be down a road between two data centers in the same AZ that, you know, are a kilometer apart, or it could be another AZ, whatever, whatever it's outside our physical control, we encrypt all the traffic all the time. And that's, that's actually very valuable from a security perspective. This other one is just really cool, and I'm glad we're doing it, but it's, a, it's more of just of a, like, hey, since we can, we should. Key management. <clears throat> There's a couple different cases here. So EBS, obviously, 
key management is very important and somewhat complicated because instance lifetime and EBS volume lifetime are independent things. You can have EBS volumes that you attach and detach. They can live forever. They can be attached to different instances depending on time of day, whatever. So we have to you know, make them very autonomous. And the way we do that is by having every volume have, uh, working with KMS, our key management service, whenever a volume is created, the, whoever's creating the volume will uh, call KMS and say, I want a data key and I want an encrypted copy of that data key. And the only thing that's ever stored persistently is the encrypted copy of the data key that's stored in the volume, in the metadata of the volume. In this case, the Nitro controller who asks for that uh, volume creation will ask KMS for those two things, and it will only ever store the unencrypted copy of the data key in its memory, and only so long as the volume is attached. It'll do all the encryption with that key. If the volume gets detached, it throws the key away, and whoever reattaches the volume has to go back to KMS and say, hey, I have the right, according to the key policy, um, to ask you for a copy of an unencrypted copy of the data key because I need to decrypt this volume. So you, and you, as the user, can see those API calls from our control plane to KMS. EBS will, you'll see a CloudTrail entry. EBS asked KMS for a key, a right to use a key. Um, and there's even some extra protections there just to be very careful. We encrypt those, not only use TLS to talk between, you know, Nitro and uh, KMS, but we also use the public key of the host of the Nitro controller. The KMS has a copy of that and it encrypts the key with that before it sends it over the wire. So only that controller could ever decrypt that key, even in the case where for some reason TLS didn't do what it was supposed to do. Uh, VPC, we don't have per customer keys because you know, these are ephemeral, they rotate rapidly. Um, they're, uh, you know, the data's never stored anywhere, so. Um, we're just using kind of a, a broad regional type keys, but again, with, with rapid rotation and very careful key management, the keys actually never exist outside of the Nitro controllers. They, what exists outside the Nitro controllers are seed material, and the seed material actually goes through two different control planes to reach the Nitro controllers, so that there's never one place where a compromise would result in you being able to figure out what the VPC encryption key is because that you have these two seeds, and then the seeds themselves are not the material, and they're only used to generate the key material once you get to the Nitro controller. So again, there's a lot of care around, not because the risks are high, again, you know, carefully controlled data center network, et cetera, et cetera, but we're building this software, we care a lot about security, we're gonna build it in a very, very secure way. And we do that with our, uh, and I mentioned already how instance uh, encryption works with uh, key man generation and, and deletion right on the hardware, because in that case, the instance volume is always associated with the lifetime of an instance. It doesn't ever survive separately. So this is a really important principle for uh, the security of Nitro, and that is this idea of a passive communications design. What this means is these systems are designed to never initiate outbound connections. Think about that for a second. If it's working properly as designed, the Nitro controller will never reach out to anything and the Nitro hypervisor will never reach out to the Nitro controller. They both sit there patiently waiting on network ports for commands to come. And even things that look like push are always pull. Like if, you know, logically, CloudWatch metrics are being pushed off the box, but they're actually being, there's a, there's a get. Through an encrypted channel with authenticated API call, et cetera, that's getting those metrics from the control plane. Off the box, off the box, okay. This is a really nice property because what it means is if ever any software on these, in the hypervisor or on the Nitro controllers ever tries to, do, to reach out and do something, we know something's wrong. That's like a huge, huge red flag. And we can isolate and deal with that problem very, very quickly. That means that although, you know, through super careful design, we're very confident in the security thing, but really you have to assume nothing's perfect and so this design is such that if something goes wrong and if some bad actor is able to, for example, take over this hypervisor, there's another problem they're gonna face, but this, this problem is, what do they do? They have to respond to incoming requests in a, a funky way to maybe get out to the next layer. So they would have to like fuzz the re reply parameters. Well, guess what, we've done that, right? So. We've done all the fuzzing, we've done all the analysis, and again, I can't say it's perfect, but it's just a super hard 
problem for an attacker to figure out how to get out when all they can do is respond to commands coming from someone else. And that's true for both the hypervisor and for the Nitro controller. This hypervisor is so stripped down, it doesn't have a TCP IP stack. It doesn't have a block device driver stack. It's just a couple of user mode processes and this very stripped down KVM, and it knows how to do things when the controller calls it. That's what it does. But it doesn't ever reach out. It doesn't have, um, you know, basically uh, any facility, and if ever something like that happens, we can tell what's going on. These are really, really um, nice properties to have to really feel confident about the security of a system. Here's some additional ones. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but no DOM zero, I mean, that alone is a huge win, right? This massive amount of software that was privileged. Because even if you're running in user mode in, in a DOM zero, you know, I suppose you'd have to be root, but still, you know, there's a lot of software that's pretty powerful there. And if you can install the device driver into, in your DOM zero, you, you own the box. You can do anything. Device drivers can do anything. And there's a ton of software there that just doesn't need to be there. And so it's really nice to get rid of it. Another nice thing to get rid of is human access. I mean, we have a great track record. I go deep with customers sometimes about, you know, the safety and security of our Zen fleet. And we talk about all the controls we have and how, you know, very, very tightly controlled and tightly audited and tightly logged and monitored access to hosts. It happens, it very seldom happens. But it does occasionally happen. There'll be some log that someone says, oh, you know, I don't push that log off the box and I'm troubleshooting a problem, so I'm gonna log in and they go through this elaborate process and all their commands are recorded, blah, blah, blah. But still, if you have interactive access, you're gonna, be, you're gonna end up using it at some point. <laughs> so we've kind of removed the temptation in these systems. There is no interactive access. You cannot log into these boxes. Neither the main board nor the Nitro controllers have any interactive access. The only way to access them is through API calls. Now, again, nothing's perfect, so you can say, well, you know, it could be software flaws or whatever, um, but yes, but this is a huge improvement over this industry standard in terms of uh, security of these systems. And all those API calls are logged and audited. They have strong authentication. You can almost think of it like a SIGV4 type technology, which is used for every single call. Um, and those APIs are um, built by different teams, so that you have separation of duties, and it's, it's a very, very safe and insane and secure system. Again, simplicity, uh, you know, kind of in summary, I guess, um, before my last little talk briefly about enclaves, you know, great reduction in surface area, great simplicity. Uh, the remaining environment is, is really a difficult world for an attacker. I think I, I skipped over this um, maybe in my previous slide. Um, uh, anyway. Um, Point it being that, that I mentioned this before, that it, even if you somehow compromise the systems, there's no place to land. You don't have any tools, you don't have a shell. It's just really hard. Um, you might be able to do some kind of a denial of service thing, but uh, it's really hard to operate in these, in these very custom environments. Um, so, and also I think the focus on KVM by you know, both Google and ourselves and a lot of other um, major industry players is really healthy. Um, we've, we had some really great collaboration around Spectre Meltdown stuff, and uh, if you look at the KVM check-ins, you'll see lots of check-ins by Amazon engineers, and so I think it's a very healthy thing to have. The hyperscale providers also very focused on a common um, hypervisor technology, um, and I think that's, that's gonna be a win for us, for all of us. Now briefly, uh, you may have heard a mention of this technology called enclaves, and the idea there is we've heard customers say, hey, kind of like this idea of SGX, where I could have like the special computing environment inside my computing environment that would have some additional protections. SGX, unfortunately, was immediately compromised by researchers who found side channel attacks, so it's kind of like, nice try. Um, but we all as an industry think, hey, the concept is a good one. So what we're doing with this uh, launch is we're doing that um, a different way, not so much hardware per se, uh, but using some, some Nitro technology and some tricks in the software to give you essentially a, think of it as a companion VM that runs on this, that you allocate out of your instance. Okay, so I give you an instance with eight cores and 512 gigabytes of memory, and you, using uh, EC2 APIs, can say, carve me out an enclave with two cores and 128 gigabytes of memory, <laughs> 
your operating system will experience hot unplug events, which they can all handle now. They can lose CPUs dynamically, and they can lose memory dynamically, and they're fine. The Windows and Linux both know how to deal with that. So now your instance will be shrunken down. The Enclave will be running on a completely separate VM, but it's only associated with your instance. And there's a, now then a secure communication channel set up between your instance and that Enclave. And that's the only communications in and out of the Enclave is over a, a sort of vSocket technology. So you can therefore then uh, put trusted code and very simple code potentially one of, the, one of the key benefits of some kind of technology like this is when we run on these big VMs, I mean, we tend to run a bunch of code whose providence we don't really carefully control, right? I mean, you've got Apache running there, you've got a million things running there, and it's probably fine, but, you know, it may not be. Um, what if you could really strip down a core OS and, you know, an image with just the absolute minimum pieces of software, run that kind of in its own essentially address space, memory space that's just as separated from you as another customer would be on that same box, and then send it commands and get responses from it. So it can do special computing for you. And it has a way to reach out to, for example, download encryption keys using KMS or S3, whatever. It can, it is a way for it to reach out, get some outside data that it needs, and then compute safely in that sidecar, if you will, or side channel, bad word, thing next to you. Um, and that compute is completely isolated from the main instance. And, um, and the programming model is nice because it's basically just like a Linux container. It doesn't. There's no special programming model for that thing, and that's essentially, in a, in a nutshell, what what an enclave is. Um, there's important primitives in the system, the Nitro system, and the use of KMS to where you can basically do the equivalent of uh, you know software TPM, so you can be assured that the system that booted that you're talking to is the exact one that you asked to be instantiated. Um, so that gives you added trust. And again, flexible ways for it to interact with the outside world. But it does always interact through your instance. So essentially your instance would be its proxy. And it can have TLS connections out through your instance and have secure communications through your instance. But it, it doesn't have its own outside connections and it doesn't have its own separate block storage or whatever. It's very much contained as kind of a subset of your environment, but one that the code running in your instance, and the administrators of your instance can't access. They can only send it commands and get back results. So you could put your encryption keys in there for your thing, whatever it might be, or you could put your PHI, whatever. You could, it's a very general purpose compute environment because you can run any kind of, I mean, again, the more complicated the software you're running in there, the less the benefit of this type of technology. But if you have well-defined software, you can run it in a very safe way and have safe interaction with it. So again, in sum, uh, by applying these microservice type architectures and technologies and concepts to hardware virtualization, uh, we've really, I think, made some big improvements in the, in the state of the art. Um, got rid of a lot of unneeded functionality, better defined and better um, systematized uh, interfaces between all these different components and subsystems. Lots of encryption we can now do, with, especially with hardware acceleration, sort of performance penalty-free encryption. Um, and we'll continue to use these building blocks, as I mentioned, with enclaves and other technologies to do more and more cool stuff with as, as time goes on. So thank you very much for your time. And I will take, a, I think, a couple questions here. We have a couple minutes left. So thank you. I appreciate it. So I'll repeat your questions since we don't have mics. Anybody has any questions? Yes, sir. The question is, is there a way for this technology to make use of customer control keys that are like stored in a customer HSM, et cetera? Um, the answer is yes, but what, what, the reason that I have, I'm hesitating is because you have to understand how KMS works. It does require KMS. However, KMS is such that no Amazon employee can access the keys inside of KMS. And moreover, you can back up for permanent storage all your keys in a, in a regular HSM, because KMS now has that feature where it sort of never permanently stores keys. It just processes them in memory uh, and uses a regular HSM as, as source of uh, storage. Um, but it, it, the, you have to use KMS. And I think we can persuade you that that is an incredibly safe thing to do. But at first glance, I can understand why people might think that is not, not as safe. But 
KMS is, is exactly designed both to be immensely scalable because you ha we have to be able to call that service millions of times per second. You know, it's, it's a massively scalable cloud key management service, but also highly protected and giving customers deep control over key use, auditing of keys, et cetera, et cetera, and no way for anyone at AWS to access the master keys. That's kind of its core, core design principle. Yes. They have their own memory. They're separate computers. They're socks. They're systems on a chip. If you look at one, it's a little system on a chip with its own memory. Communicates with other Nitro con processors over uh, an Ethernet connection, basically, or over the PCI bus, but then that would only when it's okay for the main board to see that communication. Um, yeah, they're separate computers. Yes? Are we planning to add Nitro components to the old instances? No. They'll gradually age out, and all the new types are Nitro types. Um, the Zen technology works great. There's nothing wrong with it, and highly recommend you use it when it makes sense, but there comes a point where you can't be held back by the concern like, oh, they'll think the old stuff is bad if we do new stuff. You know, we'll take that risk, um, but it, it, the old stuff is good, so continue to use it when it, when it makes sense. Thank you very much, appreciate it.